On behalf of the National Advisory Committee on Constitutional Reform, I am pleased to welcome you to this, our special meeting. It is a meeting where you can share your ideas, views, and recommendations for constitution reform. As you know, the constitution is the highest law of the land and the cornerstone of the nation's commitment to upholding fundamental human rights, ensuring social justice and public accountability, and creating a strong democratic framework to guide the future development in the interests of the welfare, prosperity, and happiness of citizens. My committee is ensuring that you, the citizens, are at the forefront and center of any reform initiative, which is why we are here today. Constitutional reform is a complex and lengthy process, not just in our country, but actually worldwide. We acknowledge the numerous past attempts, which only influence the need for our collective persistent and consistent civic duty for the betterment of our nation and future generation. I express my sincere thanks for your presence here today. Your contribution is invaluable. Your voice matters. We are here to listen. On that note, let me say one thing at the beginning. We are not here as a committee to write or draft any new constitution. What we have been mandated to do is to listen to the voices, the concerns, the opinions of the population at large. Then we put that, we distill that into a working paper, and out of that, the terms of reference. The idea is when that is presented to the government, they will then engage the public in a national consultation. Coming out of that national consultation, then presumably the powers that be will get consensus from the, from the, the uh, consultation, the national dialogue, and a bill will be more than likely drafted. We, the government will engage the constitutional drafts person, the lawyers, to draft the constitution. And again, that will be out for public comment. So, get, so I want to be clear, we are not drafting any constitution. We are just listening to what the people want, what they have to say, and putting that to the government. Rest assured that all your views, those who are contributing, will be recorded, and your views, when the, the document is published on the website, you can go there, and you will actually see what you said. Okay? So I'm looking forward to a healthy uh, dialogue this evening with all members present. Thank you very much, and I await your earnest contributions. Thank you very much, Mr. Sinanan. I just want to recognize in the audience here, Mr. Anton George, who is the counselor for the Palaseco District. Welcome, sir. And I also want to recognize Haroon Awadi, distinguished businessman and sportsman for joining us here this afternoon. So as we continue in this afternoon's proceedings, I want to welcome now Dr. Terence Farrell, who will give us a background of the project and how it has evolved thus far. Let us welcome Dr. Terence Farrell. Thank you very much, uh, moderator. Uh, so I, I, I start off this presented background to, to where we are by pointing out that, and for those of you who are old enough to remember, that this is the fifth time, the fifth occasion that Trinidad and Tobago has been engaged in a process like this on constitutional reform. This is the fifth time since the 1976 constitution was put in place. The fifth time. The 1976 constitution, for those of you who are old enough to remember, uh, I was a university student at the time, um, and in fact I did send in a memorandum to the Wooding Commission as a university student. Uh, 
the Wooden Commission worked from 1972 to 1974. Very comprehensive document, and uh, it made very, very far-reaching recommendations for setting up, essentially, a republic. Uh, the, 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 the thing is that the Prime Minister at the time, Dr. Eric Williams, didn't too like what the Wooding Commission reported. He didn't too like the recommendations that they put forward. And essentially, most of the recommendations of the Wooding Commission were not implemented. So the Wooding Commission was not implemented, but we became a republic because essentially what we did is that we went from a governor general who was the representative of the queen, we went from a governor general to a president as our head of state, and the 76th constitution, the republican constitution, also distributed, moved some of the powers from the prime minister to the president. And these are usually powers of appointment, appointing people to certain positions and so on. So one of the points that we try to emphasize is that the 1976 constitution, which we now have and we are now operating under that constitution, is actually pretty much the same as the 1962 independence constitution. If you look at those two documents and you look at the sections of the constitution, not, there is very little change between what was done in 1962. And I also point out that what we did in 1962 was done very hurriedly. We were part of the West Indies Federation between 1958 and up to 1961. Remember, Jamaica had a referendum in 1961 led by Alexander Bustamante and the JLP in Jamaica. They opted out of the West Indian Federation. And as a result of that, Trinidad and Tobago and Jamaica raced to Marlborough House in London to become independent countries. And so therefore, we, we, we meant very, very quickly to the process of getting a constitution for Trinidad and Tobago at that time. All of that to say is that the constitution that we here in Trinidad and Tobago are living with today in 2024 is essentially a constitution that was given to us by the British in 1962. Now, a constitution is something that sets up the organizations, the institutions, the bodies that govern the place. It sets up the prime minister and the cabinet. It sets up the parliament. It sets up the judiciary. It sets up all of the independent institutions that you have, such as the DPP and the Auditor General, who is very much in the news these days, and the Elections and Boundaries Commission, and so on and so forth. All of these important institutions and how they are supposed to function are set up in your constitution. So we are living with a set of institutions, a little bit worse than that. The service commissions which we have, which organize and run the public service, were actually established for us by the British in the 1950s. They were put into the 1962 constitution. So the service commissions, the public service commission, judicial and legal service commission, that, we, that run the public service, that determine the public service, the appointment, promotion, transfer of public officers, is a British institution, which the British have long since got done away with, and all the other Commonwealth countries have long since reformed their service commissions, but we are operating today with service commission structure from the 1950s. We are in 2024. And it is plain to see that the institutions that we have are really not working. And we see all kinds of stresses and strains and manifestations of the fact that the institutions are not working well. So it wasn't very long after the 1976 constitution was put in place that the NAR administration in 1988 had the higher tally commission to look at constitutional reform under the NAR. Ian R. Robinson was the prime minister. And that effort, unfortunately, was interrupted by the 1990 attempted coup. The Manning at first, Manning administration in 1991-1995 didn't do anything on constitutional reform. The Pandey administration between 1995 and 2001 
did not do anything on constitutional reform, but they made some very significant and important legislative changes which impacted the Constitution. For example, we had the Integrity and Public Life Act, which changed up the, how, the way in which the Integrity Commission worked, expanded the reach of the Integrity Commission in terms of who it would, who it would cover, and so on. We had the Freedom of Information Act, which was put in place at that time as well. So under the Pandey administration, we had some significant pieces of legislation which had constitutional implications. But the urge or the need for reform remained. And in 2006, a group of businessmen and some other people, including people like the Archbishop, actually, of Trinidad at the time, Archbishop Edward Gilbert, and some other folks, so business people and civic people, civic mind people, decided that we needed a new constitution. And they con called themselves the Principles of Fairness Committee. And in 2006, they drafted a constitution for Trinidad and Tobago. All of these things are on our website. So if you go to our website, you will see all of these documents there for you. The Manning administration, which was then in power, then decided, well, if these guys are looking to, 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 to do a constitution, I'm going to get the process going. So he had a whole series of consultations between 2006 and 2009, and he had Ellis Clark draft another constitution for Trinidad and Tobago. And then in 2013, under the UNC People's Partnership Administration, we had the Ramada Committee, which did pretty much what we are doing, went around the country, had consultations, and looking at the process of constitutional reform. And in fact, out of that Ramada Committee, we had a constitution amendment bill in 2015, which made some provisions for changing the constitution. So here we are again in 2024. And one of the things I say is that if you are jaded, if you are skeptical, if you are cynical, you have every right to be. But I also say that the fact that we keep doing these things, the fact that under every administration there has been an exercise to try to do reform is telling us that the Constitution needs to change. It is not working. And we see the manifestations of that in all different kinds of ways. That we are. So we are struggling with the crime problem and we are struggling with the question of the appointment of a commission of police. And we do all kinds of things to try to fix that which are clearly not working. We have issues with the judiciary in respect of the backlog of cases. We have people who are in the remand yard for 5, 10, 15 years in the remand yard, and we can't seem to solve the problem of dealing with the, 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 just, the justice system. The parliament, well, we, we, we know what our parliament is, what it's like, and our Calypsonians have sung about it. So, so, so the point is that here we are again in 2024, initiative initiated by this government, and we are engaged in exercise. The difference between what we are trying to do and, and, and what, say, Wooding did in 1972-74 is that we have significant advantages compared to the Wooding Committee. When Wooding was working in 1972 74 we had one television station and two AM radio stations. They had to go all around the country doing what we did here. They had 40-something, 50-something town hall meetings like these. We have used email. We have received almost 900 submissions from citizens of Trinidad and Tobago via email telling us what they would like to see in the Constitution. We've also engaged people in these town hall meetings. We've engaged with experts in the field, people from constitutional law, people in the field of psychology, people in sociologists and so on, to come and talk to us about what's going on in society and how we should respond to that in respect of the kind of constitution we should put together. So that's the background to where we are today. And we are hoping, we are expecting your participation. Our job here as the committee is to sit down, to listen, to hear what you have to say. We will document everything that you are saying. Uh, the, the, the proceedings are being recorded on video. So if you speak and, and, and so on, you'll probably end up seeing yourself on YouTube or something like that um, before very long. So we are capturing all of that information. 
We are capturing your submissions. We are hard at work as a committee, pulling that together, pulling the, the, the recommendations together, and preparing the report that will go in, that will inform the consultation, the conference, the convention, call it what you will, that we intend to have to move the process to the next stage. Okay, so with that, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so very much, Dr. Terence Farrell. So, to use a perhaps not the right analogy, but a little romantic analogy, you would see a, a pretty rose among the thorns on the stage here, and we welcome the very lovely Mrs. Helen Drayton, former independent senator. So when I said the rose among the thorns, you know what I mean here. But gentlemen, don't feel too badly. She just looks a lot better than you. I see Ms. Am smiling to you here. All right. So welcome all to Separia. And as we now progress into the question and answer stage of the proceedings, I want to encourage all of you to participate and actively participate. You can pose your questions to the panel. All I was asked of you is that you maintain your decency and you do not disrespect anyone. I know sometimes you are tempted, but you know we have to maintain, we have to show them some superior hospitality. All right, so let your questions be within the confines of what we are discussing. And uh, I, you, I am giving you a limit of five minutes per person, but if you want to talk a little longer, and uh, I think I should allow it, I will. So, but if you see me get up and approaching the podium, that's an indicator that you have spoken and you are need to wrap it up, all right? So we are on even terms, we understand each other. Panel, are we in agreement with that? Yes. So we'd like to begin now the um, question and answer part of it. And we have the... So as I'm corrected, it's not so much a question and answer, but for you to make your contribution. Your voices must be heard. You must make an active contribution towards developing the constitution of Trinidad and Tobago that has served us well and how we can improve it now. So we would want to invite your contributions now. And having said that, I leave the floor open and invite any participant. Just give me your name and a brief address. It don't have to be a specific address, but a brief address as to where you are, where you're from, and then you can pose your contribution to the panel. So can I invite you all? Well, I welcome you, sir, and I give you the latitude that you require. And then, good. But you are welcome, Mr. Sergio, and I will grant you an additional time. Excellent. So I'm glad that you are in Separia. Welcome, welcome, welcome from all over Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you so very much, sir. Yes, so can we invite and start our contributions now, please? Yes, please, utilize the microphone. Good evening, Mr. Moderator, members of the committee, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Fred Rampulam, and I am from Sapphire Road. Now, I would have jotted down some things that I would like to see in the Constitution. I would have loved to do it, maybe on the computer, but uh, my car would have passed yesterday making the announcement. And it started here and the car kept going, so you only heard part of it. Thank God I looked at the newspaper today and I saw the notice that this meeting is going to be held here. So I hurriedly jotted down some points and I would like to read it out. Now some of the things I guess other people present here will want to speak about, but um, one of the things I wanted to say is that after all the consultations and all the recommendations and suggestions are made, and it goes to that final committee, when it goes to government or whoever, there should be no debate on that. All the recommendations of the committee, because I want to believe it will be an in-depth study that will benefit the country. Otherwise, it will go the way of the previous commission. Prime Minister doesn't like it, government doesn't like it, shelf it. So I am suggesting that all the recommendations made 
and I am certain very pertinent recommendations with respect to the betterment of Trinidad and Tobago will be presented in those recommendations. Right. Having said that, I want to um, suggest elections in Trinidad and Tobago should not be held on any party basis. And I will explain and suggest, and maybe you might see some sense in what I'm talking about. A country like Trinidad and Tobago, two major races, you cannot help but witness what is happening here. So I am suggesting no party sending up any candidate. Everybody will go up as independents. But you must decide before how many ministries you are going to have. And if we are going to have 24 ministries, we have 41 constituencies, right. As long as you qualify to contest the election, you will be allowed to, and <clears throat> you face the polls. Each person in their constituency will present their manifesto to their ele the, ele the electorate in their district. After the election, 41 people, if we have 41 constituencies, they will be elected. That 41 now will meet, and when they meet under the chairmanship, maybe of the president or somebody in authority, and they now select a prime minister. And they know that committee will select people to serve in the different ministries. So you'll have prime minister, and if you have 25 ministries, the rest of the elected members will form opposition, and they will decide who is the leader of the opposition. This is what I'm suggesting, whether it is in favor with the committee and the national community, I don't know. So that is point number one. No election on a um, party, this party or that party or the independence. Right. Date of election must be fixed. Five years, first Monday, five years from today is the election. Next election will be held. Not, I have it here and I have it here, and at the whim and fancy of the prime minister, elections will be called. The date must be fixed. I am making that suggestion. As I said, after the election, people elected, they will sit together and under somebody in authority or somebody with the competence to guide them, to select min, um, prime minister and minister, and the rest who did not get selected, you will be in the opposition. Ministers are to be removed only when you pass a bill in parliament. Well, not a bill, maybe a motion. Tala is not performing, take it to the parliament, and the parliament will decide. If we go that way, also to the appointment of a new minister, to fill that vacancy must also be dealt with in the parliament. The Speaker of the House of Representatives, as well as the President of the Senate, should not be an elected member. The opposition and the government, they will get together, get somebody from the outside. Or maybe, with my new suggestion, maybe we can pick somebody from within, because you have no party there. But then too, you'll have government and opposition, and you could have problems here. Get a speaker from the outside. No senator should be made a member, a uh, minister. You are there a senator, do your, your work there, but you are not to be made a, a minister. All MPs. Their term of office should be two consecutive terms. After that, you cannot face the election again. And not only MPs, but even um, regional corporation councillors, three terms, three consecutive terms. You serve one, you serve two, that's it. You drop out. Maybe after the next one, the 15th year or so, you will face the um, electorate again. All statutory bodies should submit financial statements by the stated day when they're supposed to do so. Failure to do so, 
fire all of them and find them. All the commissioners. All ministries and all state boards to report to submit financial statements to the Auditor General for laying in the Parliament. President to be elected by the electorate. Put out your candidates, maybe government and opposition, let the electorate decide who is going to be the president. Let them, let them um, the president be elected by the people of Trinidad and Tobago. So as I said, I hurriedly jotted down these points and I am happy for the opportunity to present them to you. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much for a very comprehensive presentation. Can I invite any other participant to so do? Give us your name and a brief address and make your contribution, please. Good afternoon, each and everyone. Uh, members of the head table and ladies and gentlemen from Siparia and Environs. Uh, it's a pleasure being here. My name is Rampasad Siraj. I am from the Pinal Rock Road area. Um, what I would want to say, first of all, I find it difficult to understand that there are complaints about the numbers that attend these forums, but then you confine us to five minutes. There is no way that I could say what I want to say in five minutes. So let me hurriedly say what I have to say, and I had to do some junk now as well, because of the amount that I had. I want to preface my submission by making uh, the assumption one. Most law-abiding citizens, citizens are exhaustively frustrated with the government of Trinidad and Tobago. And consequently, the constitution of Trinidad and Tobago is in urgent need of reform for the simple reason that the country is not functioning anywhere near its ideal. And at this point in time, I probably want to take a, a cue from Dr. Farrell in terms of what he had, in terms of what he had said. And I want to say this, that a constitution, a country, is built on the pillars of institutions. And at this point in time, I dare anyone in this forum here to tell me which is one functional, one functional institution in Trinidad and Tobago. We start with the office of the president. That has had its bacchanal over the period of time and continues to have its bacchanal. The office of the government and its cabinet, we know what passes for governance in this country. The opposition, equally incapable. The judiciary is in its mess like you have identified, 15 and 20 years waiting in cells with no solution. The protective services, unfortunately, is not protecting us anywhere near what we want as citizens. The integrity commission lacks integrity. The Board of Inland Revenue is literally non-functional. The Public Service Commissions are equally non-functional. And even the public itself, all these things. Presently, we have the Office of the Attorney General and the Office of the Auditor General. Two of the highest institutions in this country, which is literally non-functional, which tells the whole world that we are a two-by-four banana, banana republic. And I hope that you distinguished lady and gentlemen do not see the work that you all are putting out today goes like the 1972 and whatever other previous commissions we have. I noticed as well from Dr. Farrell's presentation, he said that there are slight tinges of tampering with the Constitution, and that happened under a pandemic government and happened under a partnership government. What has happened over the other period of time? Why can it change? I'm not going to get into the politics of it, but the fact of the matter, this country needs transparency, accountability, and good governance. I strongly suggest maybe we could think differently of discipline, toler tolerance, and production, and think about transparency, accountability, and good governance. This country is lacking, and at the rate we are going, if we have not yet reached failed state nation, then we are near there. Like I said, if the institutions in this country have broken down, how are we to survive? And I challenge anyone here. There's only one institution in this country working. You all may not agree with me, but every other institution has broken down and is being broken down and will continue to be broken down under the, under the system of governance we have. The 
The only institution in this country is working is the prisoners who are behind bars, who tomorrow can make a call on any one of us here and we are done. Nobody else in this country does anything. And if you all want me to go to identify, I have identified the institutions that have failed. But because in five minutes, I don't think I could do better than that. Because if I go through, I'd end up taking five more, much more than five minutes. Let me just touch on some of the issues, and probably the previous speaker might have said it. Maybe not in the same language. The political parties themselves. What, what, what really, what purpose do they serve? Both the major parties. I think the Constitution should define what a political party is, and if the political party takes the form that we presently have, they should not be called political parties, and there should be some drafting of legislation that allows us to have something that tells us what a party is representing a nation, not representing their interests, or as we would say, the tribes that vote for them. Both sides of the divide, we have that problem, and the country cannot go forward. Divided we are, we'll continue to fail. Election dates and public office should be fixed. The other speaker would have touched on it. We need to have this thing fixed for a term, five years, four years. There is no need why, no need for we to be having the same mess that we are having in all the time, which is the, back, the prime minister, whoever he or she may be, has to take it out from their pocket and tell us when is the election. It just is not working for us. I think also the citizens' right of recall. Of the 41 parliamentarians we have here now, together with the senators, there are quite a number of them that we could point fingers to who are not doing anything. The same way that the PNM treats Lavantil is the same way the UNC treats Sipari and Pinalele. We need to have the right of recall. See, this is the problem I have. You're going to stop me now. <laughs> Let me just touch on two other issues. Go right ahead, go right ahead. If you break my trend, I thought, well, then I face basically a stop me. Campaign, campaign financing reform. We know those who pays the piper <clears throat> call the queue. And we have the problem here with campaign financing, and nobody seems, to nobody seems to understand where these political parties end up with the funds that they have, what happens. And let me just take one second. Since you're out to cut me out, let me just put it this way. I want to touch on two issues that I don't, don't believe very many people touch, and it will raise the contention, and I'm prepared to debate it. The need for an army in Trinidad and Tobago, I think we should disband the army. They serve no useful purpose. We pay five, 6,000 people every month, and they don't serve any purpose. They can't fight no war to save us anyway, and that's the purpose of our army. Again, I'll continue to tell you very many more things that I would like to. And one of the pressing issues that I have is, for example, the issue of referendum. There is no reason why we can't have a referendum built in in the Constitution that allows the people to be able to have a save, like, for example, a right to recall and this sort of thing. We need to have those things. And the issue with regards to Tobago. I cannot understand for the life of me, Pinal Debe with a population of 90,000 people and 10,000 Venezuelans, and there's 100,000 people, and probably more than that by now. We are given $50 million in our annual budgetary allocation. Tobago with a population of 55,000 people has $4 billion and $3 billion every year with no accountability, no transparency. I am saying that if the THA Act allows for that or the constitutional requirements make the 4 and 5% disband it or tear, up the, tear it up and do exactly what you're doing for Tobago Penal Day. There is no way we should, the equity, and whatever the, I don't know if anybody has done a cost-benefit analysis on, Pinale, on, on Tobago. If somebody could point out to me, this is the cost to run Tobago, this is the benefit we're getting, I might say, okay, my view might change. But tell me, what are we getting from Tobago for three and four billion dollars every year, together with that central government pays all the infrastructural costs? Why are we in the state? And so those are two of the major issues that I would have wanted to say to you all. I mean, like I said, if Thank I you have, very I, much. But time permitting, you can have a second go if we have the time permitting. So please don't feel that we have um, curtailed your presentation. Excellent presentation. Thank you so very much. Can I invite anybody else to contribute? Now is your turn, sir.
Give us your name, a, a brief address, and your contribution, please. Thank you. Well, um, moderator, you know me very well. You know my name. My name is Joe Sergio. I have been an educator for many years, and I do play an active role in the political scene. Um, let me say to the chairman and the members of this committee, I am so grateful to be here to mix with people of your influence. I am so happy to be here, but let me say, I have been disappointed for a long while following this committee all around Trinidad, and the crowd is so small that people are not interested, not whatsoever. So something is radically wrong. And that's maybe you all should keep in mind that let us teach a subject called civics or constitution to the children in the schools. As one person said, Mr. Sergio, you should start teaching civics throughout. And you know, I'm very happy when Mr. F Dr. Farrell said at Marlboro House, it reminded me, Dr. Mo Mr. Mohammed, when I was a little boy in England, I was near to Marlboro House listening to Eric, Dr. Eric Williams, and I think so, was it Capildeo? I can't remember all of them and people like Sukaran. Well, you see, Mr. Chairman, I'm pretty old too, huh? but I'm still younger than the late Pandey, because both of us went to university together. Let me now begin my little contribution, my first point, and I think one person mentioned it, the president. The president. I would like to see in the Constitution that the president is an independent person, like Mr. Hassan Ali, I call him a president, but the present president come from the belly of the PNM. And I can remember in 2007, that same president stood up in Point Pierre, the seat of Point Pierre, and she lambasted the UNC and COP. And today, she's my president. I respect the office. I may not respect the person. So that's my first point, and I think someone made the point, the president ought to be independent. The present president, I think so only she talks about one section of the population. So my point, president, and let us go, someone mentioned about executive president. No, that is just a dream. We will not have anything like an executive president in this country because one party will keep, keep on winning. Let me go to another point somebody mentioned about the speaker. A speaker should also be independent. You know, I mean, we have um, the chairman as a speaker, and my good friend there, Mr. Mohammed, was a speaker. I do not know if they were completely independent, but I think both of them, not because they are here, they operated at a high level. And I must congratulate the two speakers here, or the, the past speakers. Okay? So that is very important. I will just take a little note of some of the points I made. So we come now, ladies and gentlemen, and members, I want to talk a little about proportional representation. Proportional representation. And I think the two speakers before didn't mention I am not going to tell you I want this change and that change. They have started. I don't know who started it. Today, the last election we had, we had the local election, 25% of a corporation getting votes, 25% in any corporation, you will get an older man, an older man. And Mr. Griffith today is an older man. In Digo Martin, thank God for proportional representation. But ladies and gentlemen, what about the seats where you have a, a narrow margin? And I want to give you two examples. And sir, you will stop me because I ask you for extra time because I think these points are very solid in our 
capitalist democratic country. And remember, I use the word capitalist because our, the Russian constitution, which I've done in detail, I did comparative politics, and they are also democratic. Now, the point is, let us take St. Joseph 2020 election. The PNM got 9,362 votes. The UNC got 8,539. A difference of what? Not much. Those persons are not represented. Let us go in a seat where the UNC won now. PNM got 7,240 votes, and the UNC got 8,300. Chairman, and those at the head table, what happened to those people who did not get a chance to elect someone? What happened to the 8,539 people who don't have a representative? What about the PNM who got 7,240 and had no one to represent them? Don't you think proportional representation would be a good thing? And I will take it a little further, not 25%. I will ask for if a person can get 40% of the voting population in that constituency, then that person should become an alderman. But then you may ask me, Sir Juba, where are we putting these people? Disband those senators, you have nine senators, how they reach there, give these people as aldermen and put them in the, in the Senate. So these people would have some kind of representation. Tell me if that is making sense. I am not telling you to change the, the Constitution, because the chairman said, we are not here, we don't have the power to change the Constitution. But you can change, you can ask, to, because these are simple things we can do in the Constitution. I'm saying 40%, okay? Now, the margin, you've got this thing, and I told you about Mr. Griffith. Mr. Griffith, the fellow who made a lot of noise and who was commissioner of police. Today he is a, a, an older man, so why, when we have general election, we cannot have all the men? My point, I hope it is taken. Okay, now, you see, all about you all go. And I've heard everybody talking about, get rid of the Privy Council. The Privy Council is serving no purpose. Thank God the Privy Council is still there. And I'll mention it. Sir, tell me when to stop, you know. Because I am, I am very loquacious and pedantic, okay? Now, ladies and gentlemen, and Mr. Chairman, I now want to go to the Election and Boundaries Commission. The Election and Boundaries Commission, that is the most important commission in any democratic country. And, in fact, I want to use the word bulwark of democracy. And when the Election and Boundaries if you have a weak election on boundaries, then the country will be weak. If you have a strong election on commission, then the country will rise. Don't forget, ladies and gentlemen, in a short while ago, what happened in Guyana? With the, um, this same commission, the election on boundary, and they had fighting, and thank God for the Prime Minister of Barbados to stand up and say, no election on boundaries commission, you are not doing your work. And you ready to stop me? Yes, please conclude. All right, tell me, you know, because yes. I want to go task to tell the chairman and all those out there that I feel very hurt about the election on boundaries commission. Let me tell you what happened. You can remember the lengua fiasco? The lengua fiasco where the, the, I don't know how the judge and judges can reach a position where they said if they do not sign a ballot paper, initially ballot paper, then ballot paper is no good. Mr. Mohamed, you know I have been a returning officer for 20 years. You know that. You know I have worked with people like Dr. Uh, Mr. Hayatali. I have worked with Maso, Dr. Maso, in the Election and Boundaries Commission. And you know, look, I brought two books here to tell you all that nowhere it, those representation of the People Act never said anything about if a presiding or a deputy presiding officer or returning officer does not initial 
then that ballot paper is no, um, that vote is no good. Rubbish. You know what the election on Bounty is doing, Mr. Mohammed? I know. They were shifting the goalposts all the time. The first thing they did, they said, listen, eh, that kind of vote is uh, rejected. And then they didn't get that. They blamed the poor polling agent. It is not the duty of the polling agent to see. It is the duty of the presiding officer. I used to deal with things of that nature. And you know what the presiding officer should have done? If the returning officer failed to give a um, to initial, he had a right to take his phone and say, returning officer, can you come to my um, where I have my office, meaning the office where the presiding officer is, and come and initial it. So can I ask you to conclude, and we will give you another opportunity if time allows? All right. Well, you, I think I'm tickling a weak thing here because the judges have failed us, and that is a serious issue, and that's why I'm emphasizing about the election boundaries. And I'm saying, Mr. Chairman, to run a country, to help a country, we must never even move a letter or a word when you all put the things about the election and boundary. The election and boundary has failed this nation. And I'm very hurt after working so many years to know you tell me. If 20 people did not initial, if 20 ballots were not initial, what do you do? You throw those votes away? No. And those who are learned will know that is wrong what they did. And I'm willing, I told people I'm willing to, but they said, Joe, you're a little fella, stay in a corner. And they, sir, if you had given me the, the opportunity, I will tell all of them about separation of powers. There's no separation of powers so, again. So we will allow you. So you allow me, you think so? No, after we have the contribution. All right, the you alone. feel I'm getting a little too hot. Okay, no, no, thank no, you. Of course not. Thank you very much, Mr. Sirk. So, can I invite anyone else who wants to contribute? Please feel free to come to the microphone. As usual, give us your name and a brief address and make your contribution. Good afternoon, all. My name is Ambrose Cardinal. I'm from Rancho Kemado. Most of the people don't know where that village is, but it just before Lucio. <laughs> I will, mine will be very, very short. It had to do with national security and crime. There is something called statute limitation that deals with minor offenses that affects the small man, let me put it that way, because I've been affected by it more ways and more times than ever so much I can recall. The police, and I'm making no apologies for saying that, the police hides behind statute limitation when an offense is committed. So much so that I want to give a practical example. And two neighbors by me were fighting, one bust the next one head, as we say in Trinidad language. Police get involved. The poor fellow was not aware that there's a statute limitation of six months for these offenses. After that, the police cannot take any action. You could take private action. Most of the people are not aware of that. And you sit waiting on the police to come to lock up the fella or to charge him or to look for a witness. And when you realize six months pass and they go back where the police, that is the end of the story there. It happened to me. A younger fella, a guy hit me, I went to the station. The police gave me a paper to go by the doctor. Followed it. They stayed there to pick it up. Time passing, I seen the guy watching me and laughing, passing. <coughs> when I go into the police, they say, well, the statute bad, you know, that can't do nothing for that again. Another case in point, a gentleman stole my property. The police brought it and brought the guy to my house. The police told me that I'll be using that exhibit in the court case. And try to admit that case, the clothes still in the wind station. I talked about it last year. Statute limitation, the police are behind because they don't want to go to court. And I'm saying that will have an effect on crime being committed because some people might not have the same temperament. 
and if somebody does something and time pass and the police didn't take no action, you might want to take action. And therein lies the rub. So I am suggesting that the national security part of the thing, somebody amend that to remove statute limitations from these minor offenses or offenses against the person. So it will have no barrier, whereas that case could always be called. The second point is uh, about revenue. We see we, property tax is a big thing right now. Everybody clamoring who don't want it, who want it. And I've seen so much of different ways that the government could institute collection of taxes. And I'm wondering why we have so much of self-employed people not contributing to national insurance, not contributing to health surcharge, not contributing to taxes in general to the government. And I'm saying that there are ways that that could be done. And I'm suggesting that the same way they go to apply for a food badge, the same way they go to apply for a taxi badge, they should be able to also submit a NIS number a border filling and revenue number, and therein we could start to gather some funds from these people who are making all this money, because the, the employed person does have to do it because the employer will take out his. They too will benefit at the end of the day from national insurance, because they'll be able to get a pension at the end of it, as it happened now. So that's just my little contribution this evening, sir. Thank you so very much. Can I invite anybody else who is willing to contribute? As usual, give us your name, a brief address, and make your contribution. Good night, everybody. My name is Debbie Cameron, and I'm from Separia, Queen Am, to be exact. Welcome. So I'm not going to stand here and pretend that um, I understand everything about this. So this little flyer here, I want to ask a question. It says here, for better service from public institutions, holding them accountable for meeting our needs and the quality and timeliness of their service to us. That is one. <clears throat> the other part is for social justice, respect for the law, justice on time, and equality of opportunity for all. I want to hear from you what this really means. Explain this for me, please. Thank you. So thank you for the contribution, Ms. Cameron, and I am assured that the committee will deal with and give you an answer towards the end of the program. So do we have anyone else who is willing to contribute? Please feel free to approach the microphone and make your contribution. And as usual, just give us a name or a brief address and make your contribution, please. Good evening, everyone. My name is Raven Ramso, Councillor for the Electoral District of Palmas Hermitage and resident of Gandhi Village, JB. So before I give my contribution, I have a couple of questions for the committee, the head table. Um, one, when was this committee set up? January. January. So January to in April now, so a couple of months, I'd say four months planning process, right? reason I'm asking this question, I'm seeing that specific areas were given two days notice, at least on social media, as I'm aware of. Two days notice that the committee is coming to their community to have a consultation, a public consultation. The purpose of this is to get feedback from the public, correct? Now, I'm not sure if you believe that two days is enough, but in my personal opinion, it is not enough. Because if you want opinions from the public, you have to make sure that you engage a wide enough audience by advertising properly. That's one. Two, are you going to areas more than once? No. Great. I'm glad that you said that because I noticed that on the 15th of April, you went to San Fernando. And I saw a flyer yesterday that 
in partnership with TYC, which is an, another body that was newly elected, and you're partnering with them and going to San Fernando. Again, somewhere that you're already covered. And that raised a red flag in my mind because TYC is a newly elected is a, um, executive. And now, all of a sudden, they're in the public and they're coming to a consultation in San Fernando. Um, they cutting it for youths, which I understand, but they're youths um, throughout Trinidad and Tobago. Why just San Fernando? And then why is the committee now doubling back in an area that they already covered when there's so many other areas to cover? And you decided to pick Penal Debe and Separia into one. This is a huge demographical area, a geographic area. And you merge that into one, and there's roughly, I would say, 30 people live so much here. Um, that, that's just mind-blowing to me, and I'm just raising that to the attention of the committee and everyone in attendance here. So now I'm going to my contribution, which is three topics I want to touch on. One, public nuisance. Two, um, vacant lots. And three, developers. Number one, public nuisance. So public nuisance is a wide, uh, a big term used by everyone and by law. Um, noise pollution is a, a very vague law. EMA has pulled themselves out of the equation of noise pollution, and they've thrown that on the, the responsibility to TTPS. Now, the discretion of TTPS is based on the officer. So if I were to make a complaint that my neighbor is playing music too loud or the dog is making noise at ungodly hours because for whatever reason, my neighbor decided he wants to have a farm. He has about 10 dogs. Now, that is up to the discretion of the officer as to how they want to treat with that. Because according to the law, with noise pollution, you are allowed to enjoy your property and make whatever noise you want within the perimeters of your property, within your boundary, your four walls. Now, if the public and according to officers who reported back on this um, feedback, is that if residents, not just a resident, residents don't collate a report and say, yes, this neighbor is making um, noise at ungodly hours and, you know, nothing is being done about it. There's a lot of run around on that. Even if you get a lot of reports from the wider community, nothing is being done on that. So public nuisance needs to be dealt with accordingly and properly and more in detail. And that is just for noise pollution on the end of music. Because, I mean, everybody would have a, um, you know, they'll have a little get-togethers. My suggestion is, you know, you probably consider in each community, you set up a council. And you have a community council, and you just make the council aware that you're having an event, so everyone is aware. We're going to be playing music X, Y, and Z time. That's fine. Um, with regards to the dogs and the animals, um, my suggestion with regards to that is either... Um, if you want to engage with Ministry of Agriculture, Land and Fisheries, God alone knows what they are doing because, quite frankly, Trinidad and Tobago is being held hostage by the African, giant African snails, and they can't seem to have an idea what they want to do about that. Um, one minute they're giving out baits, next minute they're not because they don't have funding and they're not educating the, prop um, the public properly on it. One, you share a flyer when someone is reporting that we have giant African snail, and that's it. It's your responsibility now. So if my home is infested with um, giant African snail, you have to follow the flyer and do what it advises, and that's it. But not touching too much into Ministry of Agriculture and that. If you want to set up a separate body, a subcommittee for the ministry, because it's animals we're dealing with, let's say dog, cat, whatever you want to have in your property, set up a committee in place that um, you give persons permits to have animals. Reason being, everyone wants to have a dog. Not everyone understands how to take care of a pet or another life other than a child or a human being. Why I'm saying that is if you look around in various areas, you'll see persons have a dog. Yeah, this dog chain on a chain in the sun or under a tree for the rest of his life. He's sitting there doing what? Just eating, um, discreeting himself right there, bathing in the rain, everything right there. So I think if you have a, a body in charge of um, overseeing this, you put permits in place, and you give that committee the authority to determine if this person could have this animal and then how many they're having in a residential area more so. So that's that. Touching on, I, I see the, the, the master of ceremonies is coming up. I'm trying to be as brief as possible. Um, jumping into vacant lot. Of course, as a counselor, um, I've had numerous re reports on vacant lots. Now, it's unfortunate that someone, let's say in Palm, is, um, is a residential development, 
um, between two houses is a vacant lot there. God alone knows who is the owner of that lot because the neighbor who moved in there, he knew the person who was living there, but that person decided to migrate. The contact he has is no longer available to use. It's null and void. And the new person who come in there, they don't know who the person is. That person don't exist. So if you don't have a name or any information, any contact information to lease with that person, guess what? Your counselor or your regional corporation cannot assist you there because that information is registered to legal affairs or state lands. We don't have access to that. If we have to access that, guess what? The, minute, the corporation has to pay to access that information. And we have to have some sort of information to give to that ministry to access that information, to know who it is we're going to to possibly take to court and say, you know, this is a public health hazard. And I think that is unfair that persons who are, have the right to enjoy their property now have to find themselves paying to maintain someone else's property. God, um, if you want to migrate from Trinidad and Tobago, that's your business. But if you have property and assets in Trinidad and Tobago, it should be registered with the body of Trinidad and Tobago. And that information should be shared with the local government authority so that when situations like these come across, let's say a wildfire, we have the dry season going on, which is coming to an end. A wildfire is going on. How do we know who is responsible for that lot of land? And uh, this fire now engulfed two or three houses. Who is responsible? Who is taking charge for that? And last but not least, um, with regards to developers, with regards to developers, um, I've noticed that, I'm not sure if it's, um, there's something in place for new developers, but I've noticed with a, a lot of older developments is that nothing is being done. Um, persons purchase property in a development, the developer collects, collects his or her cash, and they're gone. Nobody is seeing a body tree, nobody collecting a piece of paper, no garbage, no street sign, no um, street light, nothing like that. Nobody is, be, nobody is to be found responsible for that development. Now this is where the regional corporations comes into play, and even Wasser with sewage is through, because you would see any newspapers popping up through um, Penal Debe, for sure I can attest to, sewage issues throughout Penal Debe in developments. Why? Because the developer isn't held responsible for this. So that is something that we need to look into for sure. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much. I see just, just, uh, just before you take your seat, sir. Thank you, thank you, moderator. I just wanted to find out, um, I have a little hearing problem. Did you say that you are a counselor? Yes, I'm a counselor for Palmis Hermitage, River Ramsor. Of where? Palmis Hermitage. Palmis, under Pinal de Regional Corporation. Where we, where we live? He's my, he's my counselor then. <laughs> anyway, um, that's besides the point. Why I ask the question, uh, we have very limited time. That is, we, the committee, we have very limited time for which we have to collate all the information that we are gathering and then we are going to put it in the form of a report. What you are doing here now, it is being recorded. They, will ha they have hired someone to tr transcribe what you are saying, and that is going to go as part of the record of our um, gathering exercise. Right. Okay? We have a secretariat. It is based in Port of Spain. We have an office. We are based in Port of Spain. All of this is working towards a national convention or a conference on constitution reform sometime towards the end of, of June. Mm -hmm. And that is, what, why, that, that is what we are feverishly working towards. Right. But several weeks ago, our secretariat sent out written notifications and invitations mm -hmm. to all of the regional corporations and the boroughs, etc., asking to cooperate and to collaborate with us. One of my ideas as a member of this committee was if we are coming to Siparia, that it should be a joint invitation of this committee and the mayor and councillors and whoever make up the governing body of the thing. So that we could have got, um, reached out to councillors 
who we assume are in touch with the people that they represent. Unfortunately, I am so delighted that as a, a young counselor that you are participating and you're here. You talked about two days notice was too short. My information is yesterday, a mic went around, the, not, not all down in Davie and so on, eh? this area as a reminder, right. because as Dr. Farrell has said, we are using social media and any possible way of communicating to get people involved. Yeah. And um, unfortunately, we have not gotten the kind of response, for me to use another word, we have not gotten the kind of help that is required. I can tell you on my own, on my own, I have not informed my colleagues on this committee. I have, spoke, I have spoken at least two weeks ago. I spoke with officials of the borough of Siparia, mm -hmm. and I spoke with officials in the Siparia, um, the Pinal Devi Pinal Devi. Regional mm -hmm. Corporation. And on my own, I was trying to get that kind of help. Right. You see, we have a problem in this country. We have a, a total misunderstanding of what this exercise is all about. When a constitution is produced, my friend, a constitution is produced by the people. That is it why must I'm not here. and never must be a political party. Okay. If, it is, if it happens that way, it will not work. It has to be we, the people. We, the people, is how the US Constitution begins. How do you think ours begin? Whereas the people believe in certain values, freedom of speech, freedom of association, etc., etc. Now, therefore, this is the Constitution of Trinidad and Tobago. Dr. Farrell made the point. It was a handed out thing from 1962, Marlboro House thing, and four attempts, and this is the fifth. And I want to tell you this. Thank you for, for your time. I want to tell you this. If this time we fail, it is the people who have failed themselves. It would be the people who have saved, uh, failed themselves. We will allow, it is, this thing is working, but you know for whom? Who can abuse it? The present constitution. It is working for them. They like it so. They don't want change, and we the people cannot understand that and say, no, no, no. We have to get together, we the people, must determine our destiny. I am the people. I am the people. Good. I agree, and I, I appreciate you. your Thank response. You. Thank you. And, and, and I want to commend you for coming and participating. Coming and participating. You are identifying. But I tell you, a lot of people who are in positions to help, they are trying to kill this effort, not understanding they are killing Trinidad and Tobago. I thank you so very much. I thank you for your contribution. Can I invite the other gentleman to please go right there? Give us your name and a brief address and make your contribution. Pleasant good afternoon, everyone. Anton George, Councillor for the Electoral District of Palo Seco from the Separa Borough Corporation. Welcome to the best part of Trinidad and Tobago which is the Palo Seco district, which you all are currently sitting in. Okay? Right. I would make my contributions straight to the point, and in the end, I would just ask one question. I would like to see three terms for every politician at every level, central and local, with the exception of a local politician, local representative, moving up to the central government. That is the only exception that a politician can stay more than three terms. And I'm not saying consecutive terms because 
you might lose or you might step down for one and then come back after and you might be a terror still, right? So I would like it to be for three terms, every politician. That is the maximum amount that you can stay there. Um, I would like the CCJ to be our final court of appeal. And my reasoning for that is we keep on speaking about the Constitution is so old and it's not working and we have hindrances. But we signed up for the Privy Council in 1833. <laughs> that is a long time ago also, right? And the Privy Council is supposed to be the court of last resort for the British Empire, which we are no longer part of. So another reason is also the course to go to the Privy Council. It's not affordable for the average man, whereas we have the CCJ right in our backyard, which we can utilize. I would like to see in the Constitution mandatory national service. I know that is a touchy subject for a lot of people, but it is something that I would like to see in the Constitution. I would like to see also the right to recall any politician who is not functioning the way that they should be. And the closing question is this. In order for amendments or changes to be made to the Constitution, is it true, is it fact that it requires a three-fifths majority or a two-thirds majority to make it effective? Thank you for your contribution. Do we have anyone else who would like to contribute? Please feel free. As usual, give us your name and a brief address and make your contribution, sir. Yeah, greetings, everybody. Um, Alpha Senon <coughs> from Separia. Um, happy to see you, Mr. Rada. Happy to see you, Brother Nizam. Um, so two things that kind of I didn't come here with any particular thing, but two things as everyone is speaking come into mind about something I always, that always troubled me. <clears throat> and um, one of them is very dear to me, which is the youth development piece. And uh, I recently, thanks, I recently um, started to do some level of investigation with youth coming out of YTC, right? And uh, from my investigation, and I, and I work with these youths a, a lot. Though while they are in the YTC system, they would visit my farm and we do development training programs, capacity building, sort of um, some reform. And I observed that, well, I observed that really and truly, a lot of the youths that are in YTC, they are just there they sort of graduating to big jail. And when some of them do come out of prison, so from my well, I don't have song data on it just yet, but my guesstimation is that almost, almost 50 to 60 percent of them would go on to, to big jail, to prison, eventually. So, which means that when these youth come out of YTC, there isn't enough to hold them, you know. And they are in there. Some of them they go into YTC for sometimes it's petty crime, and what they do, they learn about real crime in YTC. Because they, they meet people, I don't want to call any area, but they meet people who have done way more, you know, worse than them. And it troubles me to think, like, what is there for these young people in order to reverse it? You know, what is really there? I mean, YTC definitely is not enough. Because as I said, if we, if we and this is something I, I want to do, and I will eventually find a way to do it, if we go into the prison system right now, um, and I'm not talking people who are being tried, and that's kind of different from who actually, you know, found guilty of, of murder or whatnot. How much of them, how much, how much of those, um, you know, adults actually passed through YTC? So that is like my first thing. I mean, I, I don't have a solution for it, but I'm just throwing out this idea that more needs to obviously be done in terms of youths, I want to call it graduating from YTC, and making sure that they don't go on to actual prison, eventually for some, you know, more heinous crime. Um, that's one. Two, the other thing is um, we would often have accidents on the road 
um, in terms of alcohol consumption. You know, people would, would, would die, people would kill each other, vehicle accidents, you know, sometimes abuse at home, um, several things. You know, people commit incest because of the, the, you know, they're drunk and whatnot. And it often baffles me, you know, like how come we don't go to the root of the problem where alcohol consumption is concerned? So we'll often say, well, you know, everybody could know, everybody's supposed to know their limit, you know? And that is such a, I don't know, it's a, I think it's almost like an ignorant thing because like how could we say everybody, everybody's supposed to know their limit when clearly everybody don't? And the bartender would continue to give this person alcohol, drink, 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 drink. They know they're going to drive home and they're going to kill somebody. So to me, it's like, hmm. So I am, I am sort of like, I think there's some, some level of reform needs to happen there. Whether it may be limit-wise, I mean, you know, or some kind of form because it absolutely, you know, it baffles me as the, we allow to just consume alcohol, consume it, Get, get to that drunken state. I know that's not everybody's case. And then you go on to be able to commit some level of heinous, I guess unintentionally because of the crime. So going back to the problem of it, it isn't the person itself. One might say it is, but it is the substance is, you know, it's illegal. You know, so that's, that's the two things that really come to my mind. The third thing, sorry, the last thing would be, um, I guess, the, ele the, electron, the, ele the electoral boundary. Um, people that are in Separia, in the heart of Separia, we often complain about the, the electoral boundaries. I don't know if this is a conversation for this committee, but I'll still let's throw it out. And in terms of proper representation. So you have areas like Queen Am Road, Separia, that is where I'm based, that is where my farm is at, my business is at. And we don't, we feel like, like if we don't get proper representation, because we are almost left behind some sort. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to discredit what some of the counselors are doing. They are trying their best. I work with most of them, some of them. But then when it comes to certain issues and whatnot, it's very difficult because of our boundaries, you know, because, you know, it's, it's penal, it's debate, it's everywhere. Palo Seco, Separia, and it's like so large. I think, I think we are the largest. I stand to be corrected. I don't know if any of the counselors could shed some light there, but yeah. So it's, it's definitely really, really, really hard. So then representation is very tough um, for people that are within, I would say, what we call the heart of Separia, which is where we're at right now. Yeah, so, um, well, I, of course, I want to say thank you guys for coming to Separia as well, too. And uh, we definitely appreciate you all being here to hear our voices. Thanks a lot. Thank you for your contribution. So can I invite any other contribution? As usual, give us your name and a brief address. Yes, and good afternoon. My name is Roger Pascal from Superior. Right, and I want to share this with the group here. You know, my grandson, I put him to sit down to watch Parliament. And how they were getting on in Parliament, he just writes the exam and say, Grandpa, it's so stupid and people will get on. No, you're looking at a youth man who we say, let me the future of the country, right? And the example that we see what happening in parliament is not a good example for the, this generation of and Tobago. And when we watch the youth and we see the youth and them acting this way, they say the government can act this way and the opposition can act this way. Why we can't act so? Because that's the example they've given us, right? And my take in it, I believe that we can get a reform First of all, when we have election coming, because if we hear the campaigning, what they'll be saying out in the campaign, you know, you, you don't want to bring your children out here to hear them. I believe we should have all them leaders, all going up to represent their party to come have a debate. And the debate is about what they could do for the country. And they could change, you know, that you is this and you is this one and you is this one. We don't want to hear that. We want to hear what you changes you could come to represent if you want to lead our country. What can you do as a leader to represent us? What changes you could make and what these things that we just talking about it and then when you see them, they get election and they get elected in the post. We see it going by the same old way, right? They don't care about the people. You don't see them again until election time. So if we can put things in place that every member of our parliament had to come to the constitution who represent them once a month to talk to the people 
I believe we will have a, a better children and Tobago because we have, we have representatives coming to give us what is taking place than we have at the Calvinian say we kicks in the parliament, right? We have to change that. And I think that this change could take place if we could have these people coming to talk to us, right? Don't come and tell them what to say because most of them, the other people go write a script for them to come to talk what the script. We want you to come and talk to the people. And that's the kind of debate we want that we are moderator not telling you what you're coming to come to start to ask you and you have to talk to the people in Trinidad and Tobago to see what you can represent us and this is what we're looking for, right? And we want representative and uh, people who are serious who want to really want to run the country, right? Because we're also blaming people. We're blaming the different military, the conventional police. We're blaming her, right? But how can you blame she when we are the people in Trinidad and Tobago who are doing it? And some of us know who doing it. But everybody's saying that nobody will protect me if I open my mouth. Right? So we need to fix all these things. Have people be really be protected and have any police come in and say, hey, they're coming and ready tomorrow, you know. Because we know we have that going on in the country. So in order for we to change the country, we have to change the mindset. First of all, and then we can have change. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do we have any other contributions? Hi, good night. My name is Brian Richards. I reside at Sign Village, Superior, currently. Um, I would have spoken before the panel previously. Um, based on the comments tonight, I'd like to reiterate a bit of that with some amendments. Um, at the Rio Caro session, we would have discussed the importance of education across the population to treat with not just the issue of reform, but with the, the development and the conceptualization of the citizen. So I'd like to reiterate that point that both the activity of this committee and the way that we structure the social arrangement going forward is one where we, we understand the value of putting at the forefront the, the education, the development of a citizen that understands being a citizen as duty to the republic, those kinds of things, if not first, but essentially and paramount. Um, based on the contributions here tonight, uh, especially in the presence of counselors from my area who, I, I, I would like to see more of them, especially in, in the instance and in the times when I'm dealing with members of the public and my own work as well. We have an issue with the current structure of representation, and it's the same thing. It works for persons who it works for, but it does not work for the population at large. I have a bit of a lamentation. The lamentation has two parts. The session that you all are having on Saturday, the advertisement to me is very concerning. My peer group, involves several persons who are budding, um, prospective, young advocates, social agitators, politicians, etc. And because of previous work experience, even the personal interactions that I've had with them, I'm concerned. I don't believe that based on those more intimate interactions than the average person, that those persons represent the interest of the youth, that those persons represent the interests of communities, those persons are working through processes, and that kind of an invi invitation solicits those persons to come out, but it does not solicit the general population to participate. Similarly, knowing that this process will come to what at least at this stage sounds like a single event, again is very concerning to me because at that point in time it falls back into the hands of politicians. Joining that with the, again, this consideration of the current representative structure, I think the committee should consider in a formal way and with some the necessary external impetus to drive the cooperation even going down to the level of community groups, um, not just local government councils, but the term escapes me at this time, but community-based groups. Um, the gentleman who just spoke is from the, uh, the civil society organizations. Thank you. 
so that there are more opportunities at more times for persons in the community to get involved. And they can get involved to get knowledge, to get information, so that they can take the time to consider and give an, inform, an informed opinion. I think part of the reason that a lot of people remain alienated from this process is because they don't know or they don't understand what it's about. I appreciate that the information is there, but similarly to what we would have discussed in Rio Claro, they, it's, it's not a priority because they don't see the value and the opportunity at this time. But outside of just this activity, we have an issue with representative process. I don't know what the solution is. I believe that we do have a structure that provides the opportunity, but I don't believe that the structure is properly being utilized in a lot of instances, and that whether it's reinforcement, support, um, even consequence on the persons who are responsible, where they are not accountable, they don't report, etc. cetera, um, that more investment by way of the Constitution and subsequent legislation go into that kind of activity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your contribution. Mr. Moderator, with your leave, please. Uh, our, you are touching on the most basic of the challenges that this committee is facing. How do we make that connection with the organized group on the outside there? I do not think that the regional corporation has a registry of these voluntary social organizations that exist within each uh, electoral division, electoral division of the, 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 the councillors. Where do we find something like this? We have a secretariat where we have been loaned members of staff, very hardworking people, and you know, they're having a very trying time. They have been loaned to us from the Ministry of Public Administration, and they are assisting us with the footworks of this whole operation. And it is, for some of them, night and day, day and night, right? Because we are working towards this deadline. I am raising the matter, you have ra uh, I, am, I am responding to the matter that you have raised for the benefit of all those who are present here. Perhaps it is not too late. Is it possible that we can, is it possible at all that we can uh, perhaps encourage and convince the leadership of the, uh, 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 of, the, of the society at the level of local government. Look, this is a people's thing. This has nothing to do with any political organization. The government is merely the facilitator. Somebody has to facilitate. And the government is facilitating this exercise, bearing in mind that it has failed from 1972 coming down the road four times before. And this time, we are seeing what is happening. My friend in blue who is leaning up there talks about YTC. I want to tell you something, if you would uh, allow me, please, Mr. Moderator. Yesterday, I had a terrible experience. An expert lady talking with us and advising us. And I couldn't believe this lady is telling us that year after year, an average of 40% of our children fail SEA, and we place them in secondary schools. 40%. And I couldn't believe. 
after that, I had problems having my lunch. And we had another meeting at 2 o'clock, and I simply told the chairman, would you excuse me, I'm feeling a little tired. Because, you know, we're talking about YTC, my friend is talking about YTC there, and this lady yesterday is talking about 40% of our children are being placed in schools where they cannot really perform. You know, so the system, try and figure out and try and help us. We want to meet with public spirited people. And we want to bring this country together. And we have to find ways and means. So, and it is our responsibility. If I had the, the, the wherewithal at my stage in my life, this, is my, this might be my last hurrah on behalf of the innocent children, my friend. You understand what I'm saying? If we can only find a way to say to people. And what I find so upsetting is what I am doing here tonight. We do not hear this kind of talk from our leaders. They are not being honest with us. They know what the problems are. Right? Every five years it is get rid of this, put this. And it is the same, it's an exchange. Because the system is not working. It is the system that we've got to fix. And those who want the system fixed must be us, the people. So I want you to bear this in mind. And if any one of you have any idea, how can we mobilize people and get people to understand that the Re, um, the revision of the Constitution, reform of the Constitution is a matter for the people and the people must take this into their hands and move with it and demand those we have put in authority to respond to our call and put aside all these divisive matters that, that keep us, you know, in the way that we are. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else making a contribution this evening? Good evening. My name is Joseph George. I live in the Superior area. Uh, I just want to say good afternoon to the head table and for you all taking the opportunity to come to hear the, the cry of the people in the southwestern region as we are here misrepresented most of the time, and we have been played by the politician from the various uh, ruling party and opposition throughout uh, Trinidad and Tobago from 1962. Um, regardless of what is happening, and you know, listening to the panel and everyone who have given very meaningful contribution, and we could go back and forth with this over and over, and this has been happening, not only at this forum, but other forums from time to time. Uh, the issue here is, as we're saying, is to solidify and get the people to become conscious of their rights, what is necessary for them to do to get to constitutional reform. It's a great 40% of our kids, they end up in, uh, secondary school, you ask them what is constitutional reform, they can't even, they won't even be able to answer that. Their parents does not even know what is constitutional reform. So you talking that to people is like, you know, it, it, a, a total great disconnect. Uh, anyway, it's important, as we say, this is the last straw. If you don't get it fixed here now, we are a lost entity. This country will end up in a very serious place, in a very dark place, like Venezuela, what we be see happening in Venezuela, you know, uh, although you have resources, the resources has not been used for the need that is supposed to meet the demands of the people in the country, and sooner or later, it's going to just get worse, 
and crime going to escalate. We know the, all the, everybody speak, the great disconnect with our, you know, um, institution. Nothing in the institution works. Everybody have a way out. And at the end of the day, the politicians, those in office and those who are opposition like it that way because as we say, there's a handful of people who benefit at the end of the day. The finances, they get what they want. Uh, the friends of the politician who is in office, they get the contracts to go and make more money. The politician get kicked back because they also, uh, they give contracts to who they want. And so even right now, as they speak about WASA and they start holding people for selling water, that's been going on for all these years. That's nothing new. But now is a good time to advocate that because the election is in the air and they got to have something. So they play with the people's minds, say, oh, yeah, well, we're holding people. We hold this one. We hold this guy. This guy is selling water. And then they say, so now even it's too much. You go look at uh, the election on boundaries. You look at election and you see election night. And you're watching how the election is going, and you're seeing red and yellow, and red and yellow one is going, and you see yellow have a vast lead as it appears on the electoral map. But then again, in the end, the, 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 the party on the opposite side say they want the election. And when you look at, if you go to compare the, the number of votes, they, there is no way they could be you know, in a position to become the leader, but because of the fact they split electoral districts, they sit down, and I want to know if there is some relationship because they say that's supposed to be an independent body where the government ruling have no, shouldn't have no interference, but boundaries being split. Even in Tobago, we saw that happen. <laughs> you know, so what's really happening? The, the, you know, it's too much of a corruption in this country and it's not going to get better, and a lot of people, I, want to, I don't want to say it wouldn't get better, but it will take a great demand. It will demand us as a people who understand, and like, because I understand the people here this evening who will come here, they have a concern, we have a love, a passion for our country. We want to see things get better. We want to see constitutional reform. We want to get things to happen in this country uh, so that it could run effectively so that our future generation, our children and our grandchildren could have a home, a proper place to live. You understand it? Too much money, too much everything is passing through this country and they are fooling the people. You put up fire, you make up, you put up a fire station in point, it don't have no engine. It don't have this, it don't have that, but you come into cut ribbon and say you're opening that. How that could function? All these babies come and died in support of Spain General Hospital. The Coover Hospital is there. The Children Hospital, you know, now we have a uh, commissioner inquiry taking place. Why all these things is happening? Why is we not having proper management when all this money is being spent and then you have to pay all this money for commissions to come and sit to have inquiries when we as the people are suffering for basic needs? That money should be used to take care of the people in the society, the, the less fortunate people. We can't get roads, we can't get water. It's a lot of, you, you go for lights, it's a whole run around with the Electricity Commission. Roads, even like state land, there's areas in this district and I guess surrounding where the um, people went and squat. Uh, at one point in time, the gov the the then government said they was going to do this uh, certificate of comfort to make it easier for the, 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 the people who are living in the area. Uh, I, and I don't know where that hap what happened with that because I wasn't here for a little while. When I came back, I tried to investigate because I'm also a person who live on a piece of state land. I can't afford to buy no land. When I come back and I'm inquiring, it's like this uh, certificate of comfort is not really something uh, feasible because nobody seeing to everybody saying well they have our office there. You, you, then they say they know they just they just, they just ban that. They're no longer doing that. How can, so how are people going to be able to live uh, you know a lifestyle comfortable and take care of the family 
when the government is not providing, you can't get a NHS house, you can't get this, you can't get that, if you don't have a, you know, affiliation, and even sometimes with the affiliation, you are denied, because they don't like you, you're just eh, making it, brother. You have to stay, you have to find a way on your own accord, and as they say, everything is flawed because the police not functioning, the, 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 the board, well, we was county council, now we have mayor, and those are key players, you know, as Mr. Mohammed said, those are the people who are supposed to be here this evening, a listing of all the active, active, we got to be activists. If we are activists, we need representation. The, you know, as you say, a listing should be at the office uh, in the borough whereby the, 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 the mayor or the councillor, whoever, should reach out and say, hey, here's something that is very important. We want to develop this community. People in Palestine, they say it's the best place. I hear my friends say that, and I agree. No water. No running water for years. They got to be campaigning, you understand? People are fed up. They are fed up with the nonsense, and that's hence the reason people is resentful to come out when you people talk about trying to get changes. They say nothing could be done because that's how the system is structured. As you say, it's a mm. system. So when the system is in place like that, People feel, you know, that they don't have a fair chance to bring about it. You're making a point, it doesn't make any sense. It's not going to be addressed. It's not going to make anything better. And then, party card, you know, because people are so misled. When so can, they, I, can I ask you to round it up because okay. time is against us. Right. So I would like to see um, what Mr. Mr. Mohammed said and this young man. And my friend here, who Mr. Sennon with the white, these are the people we got to most likely try to target and advocate with, to maybe start with, and see how maybe we could branch out into the wider community with the less fortunate people and try to let them know. Thank you very much. So, as we are looking at the clock, I know that some people would have want to make a second contribution? The people who spoke first, anybody would like to give a contribution before we wound up? Oh, so, sorry, go right ahead, my good friend. 